Hello everybody, welcome back to Rain and Pause. I'm Mitch and today is Resin Day. It's been a little while since I have um, updated my resin video and I wanted to go through with you today because I do have quite a lot of resin to do. So I wanted to go through my whole process, show you my new process and how things have changed since last time. So here on my bench are all of the things that I use when I am doing resin. I'm sure that there are other things that I use and I've forgotten about, but I'm going to show you the ones that I've got here. And I'm going to start first with my resin. So the resin that I use and love is Stone Coat Countertop Epoxy. So this is an American um, countertop epoxy. I, we can get it in Australia. There are several supplies of this at the moment. However, they are all out of stock at the time of filming this video, which sucks because I'm nearly out and I will need more. Uh, so when I'm using this epoxy, I get the Stone Coat Countertops Stone Coat Epoxy Heat Resistant. This is the one that you're looking for. Get a good look at that. That is the exact epoxy that I use. Do not get the art coat, do not get anything else. Look for that exact bottle, okay? It is heat resistant, it's scratch resistant, it's amazing. I use it on all my coasters and I use it on all my art as well. They do have an art coat specifically for art, but this does the same job. Now, uh, next I have um, something to mix the epoxy. So I bought these little mixing sticks off, I think it was Sheen or Amazon. Um, they just go into your drill. These ones are awesome because they have a little attachment, a little hex attachment that goes into the drill itself. And you just pop it in and it makes mixing your epoxy super easy. Now, this one does get a lot of use. It's got some dried epoxy on here. I leave it there. I don't cut that off or wipe it off because this actually helps when it's mixing. Um, it creates that vortex and makes sure all of those little strands of resin are mixed in. So uh, just attached to a normal drill, nothing fancy there. Next up, um, safety. So the most important thing with resin is safety. You must wear gloves at all times because resin will soak into your skin. So the gloves that I like are nitrile gloves. I, these are the cheapy brand from uh, Bunnings um, Sabco and they're really, really thin. I'm not a fan of these just because of how thin they are, although I am because they're not as hot. Normally I use proper tattoo artist gloves. So this brand, the black ones, they're a lot thicker and they're much more puncture resistant. However, we don't need puncture resistance when we're working with resin. We just need chemical resistance. Um, I'm also allergic to latex. So nitrile is much better. It's made from the same material as latex, but it's processed again to remove the latex protein. Um, being a thinner glove as well, they do tend to ride up. Now, when I'm working with resin, always I am wearing two pairs of gloves. So this is my base pair, and then I have a second pair on top. I will show you the reason for that when I'm pouring, but it's pretty much so that between batches and when I'm spreading the resin out with my hands, I can put one set of gloves on. I have this cuff further down, and then I can pull the top pair of gloves off that's coated with resin, and I'm still not touching resin because my hands are coated, okay? So two pairs of gloves at all times. You do go through a lot of gloves, but much better to go through lots of gloves than to you know have resin in your skin. Next part of resin safety, I'm wearing an apron. Um, you can wear an apron if you want. Wear clothes that do not attract dust. And dust is the enemy of resin. It will screw everything up. So make sure you're wearing an apron and clothes that don't attract dust and do everything you can um, while you're resining not to create or move dust. The most important part is protecting your lungs from the chemical fumes in the resin. So you will need a uh, respirator, not a mask, not a face mask that you wore during COVID, not a dust mask. It must be a respirator with a silicon gasket that forms a tight seal around your mouth and nose. Um, this one is a 3M brand. The, a lot of people use this one. I like it. It fits your face well. Um, and you need the N95 filters or higher. They must be rated for gases, VOCs. Okay. So look on the packets, make sure they're rated for VOCs. Now you do need to change these filters often. Mine are due for a change. Um, and you just buy, I buy these from Bunnings. You need to change these ones and these ones. Okay. There is another little filter in here that must be changed. Good thing to note when you're wearing a respirator is it should form a tight seal. You will you will sound like Darth Vader. There's a little uh, pocket under here. It's a one-way seal, so it allows air in, but uh, sorry, it allows air out, but not in. These ones allow the air in. Okay, so when you're breathing, you're breathing air through here, 
and out through this little gasket. So it should make a tight seal. You shouldn't feel any air coming out around the seal and you shouldn't be able to smell anything. So a good way to test if your mask is working is spray, uh, put the mask on, spray a bit of perfume or a deodorant and inhale. And if you can smell the deodorant through the mask, your mask is not working, okay? It's meant to filter out all gases. So good idea to do that every now and then, just do a test, make sure that it is still doing its job. Um, I'll quickly jump back to mixing tools. Um, I have a variety of things that I use to mix my resin. I am in love with the Fluid Art Co mixing paddles. These things are super sturdy. They're really awesome. They've got a nice flat edge or a flatter edge on one side so you can scrape down the sides of your cup. And it's like a butter knife almost um, on the other side, nice and curved so you can get in there and um, reach the bottom of deeper cups. Um, you can also use your paddle pop sticks, your popsicle sticks. Um, these are disposable bamboo knives. Um, and for a long time I used these, and I still do use these, the Dirty Pour Artist mixing sticks. I don't like the Fluid Art Co. smaller sticks when I'm mixing large volumes of resin. I find they tend to be a bit too flexible, but you can definitely use them for smaller cups. Speaking of cups, measuring cups. An accurate measuring cup is vital to your success with resin. The smaller ones that I use are from a brand called Pixis, which we get from Amazon, and these go up to 240 mils. Now, you don't want to overfill your resin cup because when you're stirring and mixing, you don't want it to overflow, and you want to be able to mix everything properly. So, um, Stone Coat Countertop Resin is awesome. It's uh, one to one by volume. Always mix your resin by volume unless it's specifically stated on the bottle to mix by weight, or you have done the calculation to measure out your uh, resin by weight. What I mean by that is you fill up your cup with say for example we're mixing up 250 milliliters of resin which I will do today uh, sorry 500 mils so I would mix up 250 millimeters of uh, milliliters of part A resin and I would weigh it. Keep note of that weight and you want to do you want to weigh the cup separate first so you minus the weight of the cup Weigh your part A first, or your part B, whichever one you're doing first, weigh one part and write down how much that weighs. Then weigh out your part opposite, <laughs> whichever one you didn't do first, and write down that weight as well, because that will tell you how much part A and part B weighs, and then you can work out the weight to volume ratio of each part of your resin. So if you wanna do that, the thing I suggest would weigh out 100 milliliters of each part, because then you can easily multiply, 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 divide, subtract, add, whatever you need to do. And it's easy because it's in a multiple of 100. You can divide it by 10. If you want shorter quantities, you can multiply it by 10 if you want larger quantities. So um, always weigh out your resin in separate parts if that's how you want to mix. And that way you can use a scale to mix your resin. But always use volume first. Um, the second brand of cups that I really like are from TCP Global. I got these on Amazon. They're not on there anymore, so I'm just waiting for them to come back in stock so I can order some more. Um, and these are really accurate. Now, the way that you test the accuracy of your cups, do not ever assume that your cups are accurate. The way that you test is to weigh out 100 mils of water and it should weigh exactly the same as the measurement of, of uh, volume. So on these, I actually did this test when I bought these cups, and that's how I knew that they would be accurate. I filled the water to 50 milliliters and weighed it, and it weighed 50 grams. I weighed it, uh, filled to 100, weighed 100, to 250, weighed 250. So I made sure that it was accurate at each measurement on the cup, and if one is accurate, you know, chances are they're all gonna be accurate because they were printed on the same machinery. Um, but I do did do random spot tests from the packet to make sure that they were all the same, okay? It's a bit tedious, but you need to make sure that they are accurate because not having accurate resin, resin measurements may mean that they won't set. Next up, uh, removing bubbles from your resin. So there are three ways you can do it. Um, and the heat gun is my primary source of heat for this. Um, yes, heat gun warms up the resin, make sure it moves and flows better, make sure it self levels. Resin will self level, but only if it's liquid enough. If it's too thick, it won't. So if it's been sitting for a little while and it's starting to set, it may not level itself out. So a heat gun will warm it up, make sure it levels out nice and flat. And um, that will pop majority of your bubbles. 
I always double process and I use my torches as well. So I do have two different types of torches. This one produces a much smaller flame. This one is a chef's brulee torch. This one produces a much larger flame. This is the one that I tend to use more often just because I like it. It's much more comfortable to hold. This is an Appetito brand. I believe I got it from House. Um, which is a kitchen supply shop here in Australia. And this one is a, I think it's Sonai, Sokai, Sukai. Um, it's off Amazon. It's a 901 torch, a uh, much smaller flame. Uh, you probably can't see it there compared to <laughs> a much bigger flame, okay? Um, now I have just refilled these with butane. So you can get propane or butane torches. Um, it doesn't matter which you use. This is the butane that I use. This is the butane gas refill, okay? I filled them up because they were both flat out empty. Last method you can use to remove bubbles is by using isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol will dissolve resin. Um, I use it in this little spray bottle. Um, this is not actually 90, 98% in here. It's 100% isopropyl alcohol. So I got this from a kitchen supply shop, a hospitality supply shop. And you can buy this from um, Sydney Chemicals, I think like in a 20 liter drum and it costs you like $30. It's super cheap. Um, but I put it into this little mister bottle and um, once your resin has been spread out and it's uh, ready to settle, you can just mist a bit of alcohol on top and it will pop all of the bubbles by breaking the surface tension of the resin. Um, this is also what I use to clean up everything. It dissolves resin. It also dissolves paint. So if you have paint that is built up on, say, for example, a stir stick, and I'm just going to give it a little spritz with isopropyl alcohol, and if I give that a rub, that should dissolve the paint. Um, it, it has been on here for quite a while, so it is baked on, but it's gone. Okay, super easy, super cool, super quick to clean up with. Um, and it, it actually advertises on the isopropyl alcohol bottle for windows and glass tables. So it will leave a streak-free finish, which is awesome. Um, and I've got a little bit in uh, this little pump bottle. It's like a little makeup remover pump bottle. So you just push it down and it will squeeze whatever liquid is out the top. Um, super useful when you're cleaning small patches, just put it on a bit of damp paper towel. Um, and the last thing is uh, paper towel. I go through a shit ton of this, <laughs> so much. Um, I use it to clean up everything, uh, wiping down tools, wiping down benches, paint brushes, everything. Um, so always keep a good stash of paper towel handy. I like the Viva brand because it's nice and tough, nice and strong. Um, and just as a little thing that I do a little bit extra with my resin, um, like I said before, dust is the enemy of resin. So I put glitter into my resin and, uh, I did buy, I do, and I still do have lots and lots of tubs of resin pigment from Artisu resin. So I'll show you what that is. So this is the brand and they closed down when I first started pouring. So I made sure I got my hands on a whole heap of these pigments. Um, and I do have some resin projects that I want to do and I want to utilize these because I've got 30 or so jars um, and they're just sitting here not being used because I love my TLPs. Um, so this is the original one that I was using, which is the sparkle pigment. Um, but I, I wanted to test out a different product to make sure that it worked. And because you can't get that anymore, I'd be lax if I didn't tell you what else you could use. So this is the one that I now use. This is Unicone Art Crushed Crystal Magical Mica Pigment Enhancer. <laughs> okay, bit of a mouthful, but I'll try and get it up on my close-up camera here. This is the, um, the glitter that I use, hopefully. There we go. Okay, so this is it. Now, the other product that I like using is from Vonka Chez, who is an American supplier. And it's this little jar of pigment called Ocean Boost. Now this is a super, super fine glitter. It's not actually a pigment. It doesn't form a single layer when you uh, put it into resin or paint. Um, so it's not a pigment, it's not a powder. It is a super, super fine glitter. And this just adds a little tiny bit of sparkle, extra sparkle to it. I use these extremely cautiously and very, very little because it can very quickly overpower everything, okay? So that is all of the equipment, the rundown of everything that I use to do my resin work. Um, I do have a full rack of resin to go through today. So I'm gonna get started and I will talk you through my process. So I'll clear everything off 
I'll be right back. Oh, I should also add, um, I've protected my bench with puppy pads and underneath I have Fluid Artco silicon mats. Um, I've got the big white ones that cover my whole bench. They're awesome. So I use the puppy pads because I can wipe off my stir sticks and everything on them and then just throw them out once everything's done. And I do use them multiple times. I don't just change them every time I pour. I do change them every time I resin because they will hold dust and particles. Okay, so let's clear everything up. I'm gonna get my uh, resin pieces out and I'll show you my process. I'll be right back. Okay, everybody, so I'm back and I have my coasters and placemats and everything that I need to be resin laid out on my table. It's very important when you're working with resin to be organized. Make sure you have a process in your head of how things are going to flow and the order in which you're going to do things. So I've got on my bench, I've got two lots of eight coasters and then I have four placemats. So these placemats are a custom order for a client. Um, I did some coasters for them a couple of years ago and they requested matching placemats. Now, because I couldn't guarantee that they would match, I also did a set of coasters which the client has decided to take, which is awesome. So that's my main focus today and that's why I'm doing these first. Now I've also got some beautiful coasters here which I'm in love with and resin will completely transform how these look as well. So I've got my close-up camera going, hopefully we can catch some of that beauty. Now, um, I've already gone through these trays and I've lifted the coasters off the plates because I like to handle them manually and spread the resin with my fingers. Um, it's at this stage that if you are just drying your paintings in the open, that dust could get into them. So what I uh, used to do was take some isopropyl alcohol, spray it on a paper towel and just wipe the dust off. I don't do that anymore and you definitely do not want to spray isopropyl alcohol directly onto your tiles because it will start to dissolve the paint very quickly. So always spray it onto a paper towel. You're just giving them a really light wipe and away you go. Now I used to believe that um, oils from your fingers um, can repel the resin. I'm not so sure I'm a believer of that anymore. I haven't wiped my coasters for a very long time um, and the resin does just fine. So it could just be the stone coat being nice and thick and able to cope with that oil, um, but it is recommended to just give everything a light wipe down, especially if you've gone through and you've been touching everything. Um, just give it a wipe down. But I generally, once my coasters are dry, they sit in the rack and I don't touch them. So if you haven't touched them, you're good. Um, Okay, so it's very important to make sure that your surface is level. I know for a fact that my table is level. Um, I check this regularly. I've made sure that the wings are all level and it's important to get these kind of level. They don't have to be 100% perfect, but it definitely helps. Reason being the resin self levels and it will slide off if you haven't got these level. That's why I like using these little plates, these party plates um, or the bowls because they're flat. Um, every time. The base is the perfect size to go under the coaster and it's a nice sturdy top as well so they're not going to wobble around. I used to use uh, plastic disposable um, cups like this. Uh, the problem with these was they're a little bit too high and just a little bit too small. If you do them standing up this way, yeah that's the same size as the coaster but this part's wobbly so I used to have a lot of coasters fall off um, and they can be quite expensive but I did also purchase these, which are lower. They're a little bit shorter. I haven't actually tried these out yet. So if the plastic bowls become scarce, I have a backup for that. So making sure everything's nice and level, we're going to um, ensure that there's no dust. So what a lot of people do is they'll take a spray bottle with water and just mist the area that they're working in. And that will uh, cling to the dust and cause it to settle. Um, do that about an hour before you come into work and just try not to stir up the dust on the floor or anything like that with your feet. Um, as a final precaution, uh, get an air purifier. I bought a True Sense Z1000 air purifier, which is plenty big for my studio and I've never had a problem with dust. It's been off for a little while actually. Um, but the other thing I have is I've got a baker's rack with a plastic cover. Um, that just prevents any dust from going in or out um, because I do have my laundry in here and there is washing that I need to hang out. Um, but yeah, put that plastic cover on, that will stop any dust from getting into your resin pieces once they are done. Okay, so that's it for prep work. Now I'm going to get my second pair of gloves on and just straight over the top of these ones. And like I mentioned earlier, the reason I do this is so that I've always got a barrier between my skin and the resin. And 
this is the first time I'm using these gloves for resin work and I'm not sure I like how they're going to go just because of how thin they are and um, I can't pull the cuffs down and have them stay. So we're going to see how it goes. Um, they're definitely much airier than the ones I usually use. Okay, so I leave this cuff here because that way when I'm done with the resin, I can pull this glove off and I've got a fresh one and I'm not putting little patches of resin on my wrists. Okay, uh, so I'm going to mix up 500 milliliters of resin at a time. I've got my TCP cups here and I do use the same cup multiple times to measure resin. Um, I Once I've poured all the resin out of this, I just estimate there's maybe 10 to 15 mils of resin left in the bottom there. And then I just add another five or 10 mils um, to my measurements to account for that mixed resin at the bottom. I've never had an issue doing this. Uh, it doesn't cause the resin to cure quicker. Um, I do work quite quickly and I'm going to tell you how long it takes me to do all of my resin work today. Um, I'm going to film all of it on my cameras. Um, the close-up camera won't be going the whole time, so I'll show you the close-ups for these and I'll film the top down, uh, do a time lapse and I'll tell you exactly how long it took me today. So, as it stands, I have uh, two, one, <laughs> learn to count Mitch. Um, I've got 16 coasters here, 16 there, 16 there, so 48, no, yep, yep, 48. Uh, I've got another eight there, so I've got quite a bit of resin to do. So, mask is going on. Because now I am opening up the resin. As soon as you open up those bottles, you should be wearing a mask. Okay, so into my measuring cup, I'm actually going to measure out my part B first because it is thicker, but sorry, thinner and it has yellowed. The hardener will yellow over time. That's part of what resin does. Um, that's why I like working over a black base so the yellowing is not as noticeable. Um, once this mixes, it will be clear. Okay, so don't stress. Now the reason I do part B first is because it is thinner and it will mean that the thicker part won't stick to the sides of the mixing cup. So I'm going to measure out 250 milliliters of part B and then 250 milliliters of part A. Always mix all of your resin first and then add your colorants so that you can ensure that everything is mixed correctly. And you want to get down at eye level, look at the side of the cup and ensure you are as accurate as possible. Now, if you are known to have an allergic reaction to resin, please, I also advise wearing long sleeve shirts, uh, wear eye protection as well, and make sure that you are fully covered. A full hazmat suit may be the way to go, a Tyvek suit. Um, you do not want to have an allergic reaction. So I have my 500 milliliters of resin measured out. And to counteract the yellowing, you can add just a teeny tiny drop of purple or violet. So do I have any violet? I think I do. And when I say a teeny tiny drop, like the end of a toothpick worth. Um, so I am going to just do this. I'm going to use my mixer and I'm going to mix this until there are no streaks. Now, you should time it and mix for three minutes until there are no streaks. You will get plenty of bubbles, but they will come out when you torch them, okay? So I'm just gonna give this a really good mix. Okay, so I've done a preliminary mix and I'm going to hover my mixer over the surface of my paintings. Now, it doesn't matter if that's not fully mixed yet because it will um, it will get mixed on the surface. Then I'm going to take my mixing stick and give the resin a stir and I'll just use a paddle pop stick this time to peel it all off the sides of the cup and scrape the bottom. Then I'm going to go back in with my mixer. Fantastic. Give this another good mix. Now, my resin here looks milky white because there are so many bubbles in here. If you have a vacuum chamber, you could 
remove all of these bubbles but you would need a, a container that is three times the size of the volume of what you're using and it does take a little bit of time to do so which means that the setting time of your resin may be decreased so uh, depending on how fast you work that could be an option I am not too fast because I know all of these bubbles are going to come out when I put it onto the surface so I'm just going to set the mixing stick aside and now I'm going to add the glitter so I'm going to add my unicone resin glitter first and the amount that I add to 500 mils of resin is tiny this much okay not much at all I'm going to add even less of that even less than that I should say of the ocean boost uh, maybe the same okay little teeny tiny bit so you can see that these glitters and um, powders they go quite a long way it's just to add another layer of sparkle the main feature is your design and this is just to hide any little bits of dust or dirt that get in there because you're looking at the sparkles rather than the bits of dirt okay lids are always on in case you knock them take your stir stick and I'm just going to stir this in I don't need the mixer for this one just give it a good stir everything's nice and mixed all your part A and part B are mixed together And there we have some beautifully mixed resin okay now when I am working I work in batches leaving the resin in this cup in such a volume will cause it to flash cure a flash cure means that the reaction will speed up and it will continue to speed up exponentially until it is hardened which means you could end up with smoking you could end up in the worst most severe cases with an explosion so to do that uh, to minimize the effect or the um, the chance of that happening we're going to pour this onto our coasters and divvy up all of the resin um, so it's in smaller quantities and it's less likely to heat up so to do that I just pour it straight from the cup use the stick to wipe up the edges and whenever you're working with resin it is always handy to have some resin molds um, to put any of your runoff into reason being you don't want to waste resin it's expensive now I did put just a little bit too much on this one so I'm just gonna pour some of that off and I will show you the technique that I use to make sure they are all coated evenly now I have worked out how much resin I need I can coat each coaster with 8 to 10 milliliters of resin it's not an exact science but that's the value that um, I have worked out 200 milliliters of resin will coat 24 coasters I think was pretty much the calculation I did one cup one full cup of the Pixis cups will coat 24 coasters okay so I always keep a little bit of resin in the cup in case I need it now we're going to take our first coaster and I use my middle finger to spread the resin over the surface first make sure every speck of paint is covered then I take my finger take a little bit of resin from the top and coat the sides make sure all of the corners are covered and then you can wipe the excess resin off and there we go everything's covered so tilt it in the light and make sure that you can see every side and edge every corner every single part is covered with resin then you take your next one and I'm going to hold this over one of the other coasters it can be one that you think might have had a little bit less resin on there or one that you've already done and the reason I'm holding it over another coaster is so that I can catch all of the drips and the runoff again you don't want to waste resin so doing it this way you can ensure that everything gets coated and nothing is getting wasted okay and you can see we've already done two coasters do this one once you get the hang of it and once you get into the rhythm this process goes incredibly quickly ok 
okay so there's another one and then when we heat up the resin to pop those bubbles it's going to flow a little bit more that will mean that it's going to fill any little voids and cracks as long as you have touched it with resin so if it's a little bit thinner in one area and thicker in another as long as resin has touched it the resin will fill the gap resin will not flow where resin hasn't been okay remember that so this one had a little bit too much on it so i'm just gonna hover that over another one over the one next to it it was way too much on this one and it just had too much because it was dripping from the drill as well okay so this process is super quick shouldn't take you too long um, I estimate that I could probably get that whole rack done in maybe an hour and a half. Uh, the longest part, to be fair, is mixing the resin, so... Okay. And I don't know if you can see the changing colours. As soon as the resin goes onto the piece, the colours change and they just look incredible. They really come to life. Now, it is always handy to have some bigger pieces to do as well as your coasters uh, so I do have four placemats here as well and when you if you know that you've got enough resin on all of your coasters you can just hold hold them over the surface of the placemat to catch all the drips and use the resin runoff that way okay so I'm going to put this into fast forward for the moment while I do this next tray and then I will show you how we torch and remove the bubbles alrighty so I have finished putting the resin onto all of the coasters and placements that I have on the table at the moment now I was not careful enough and I managed to get resin on my wrist so it happens sometimes the most important thing is you act quickly to remove it so I just have some eco wipes these are Dettol wipes um, or Ajax wipes, uh, the kitchen wipes, and I'm just wiping it off my wrist, make sure, making sure I get all of it, and I'm going to give my arms a wipe while I'm here as well. Um, but I've taken that first pair of gloves off, and you can see I've still got a second pair of gloves on, um, which means that I can now touch my tools, I can handle everything, and I'm not going to get a yucky resin everywhere. So I'm just going to make sure I've got all of this resin off my wrist first, and then we're going to proceed. So now the first step is to use the heat gun to warm up that resin, pop most of the bubbles and get the paint, the resin flowing. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I have it on the maximum setting on the highest setting. So you're just doing a really quick pass over all of them to pop majority of the bubbles, the bigger ones. Now, at this stage, before I torch, I'm going to have a look from the side to make sure the whole surface of my coasters are covered because I did notice that there are a couple of spots that I missed or that repelled a little bit of the resin upon initial contact. So just adding a tiny dab of resin here and there and removing any little, little bits of hair or fluff that may find their way in to your pieces. Having a light from the side also helps. Uh, now I'm going to take my large torch and we're going to pop all of the rest of these tiny little bubbles. Okay, so when you are torching, hold your torch four to five inches above the surface of whatever you are torching and do not ever let the flame contact your surface because you will burn it and you'll end up with a rough crinkly patch that you will never ever be able to get out. 
So now is the last chance that you have before this resin is going to set to fix any little patches, spots, get rid of any fur or hair that may be in there. Okay. And try not to touch this now with your gloves. Use the stir stick all the time now. We're just going to pull out any bits. Add a little bit more resin. Now, a lot of people say you should babysit your resin. I am of the opposite opinion. Once they're done, put them away. That way they can't get any dust or dirt on them. Okay, so these are now all done. We're going to put these onto our drying rack and move on with the next set. Now it's really important that your drying rack is also level if you are using one. And if you are not, cover your pieces with a box, not with a net, cover them with a box that is going to be completely impervious to dust. Now as I'm putting these away, I'm also just tilting them very slightly in the light to make sure that I'm catching every angle that might possibly um, uh, that I can see the reflection in the entire surface of the coaster and that's letting me know that they are all perfectly flat no bubbles okay this one's good whoops so this one has a little piece of hair in it And if you noticed, I did torch multiple times. Let the bubbles settle, let everything heat up, then torch again. Okay, so that is the first lot of coasters done. Whoops, my shoes just come off. <laughs> Alrighty. Now I do still have a little bit of resin left in my cup, so I'm going to do one more set. And I'm going to film this. I'll put this all into uh, double or triple or thousand speed, whatever it is. And we're going to go from there. So stick around and I'll tell you how long this takes. Now just really quickly to clean up any tools and things that you want to keep or that you um, that, that are not disposable like my Fluid Art Co stir sticks. Quick spritz with isopropyl alcohol. Paper towel. Now my measuring cups I won't clean out. You can, especially if you use silicon ones, you want to keep those. But isopropyl alcohol all over the top. Clean it up and she's ready to go again. Okay. Super duper easy. Takes less than a minute to clean up and I am going to put my cup in the bin. Alright, so We'll come back once these are all fixed up, once they're all cured, and we'll see what they look like. Hey everybody, okay, we're back. It is the day after, so it's been just under 24 hours since I poured the resin onto these coasters, and they are ready to take the tape off. Now, I take the tape off pretty much the, straight away, uh, so that the resin is still soft enough that you can cut through it and you're not going to get any lumps stuck to the back. So I'll show you the process that I now go through to remove the tape from these. So um, I haven't changed my taping up process at all, so there is a video on my channel showing how I tape these up, um, but I have slightly modified how I remove the tape. So instead of pulling the tape off and fiddling with the drips and then cutting through, I just cut straight through now. So what I do is I angle the blade of my knife and I only have the smallest bit exposed. The reason is because I use ceramic tiles, the ceramic will dull the knife very, very quickly. So what I do, and let me zoom in here so I can sort of show you, but I will try and get it on the close-up camera. Um, what I do is I take the blade of my knife and I put it face down onto the corner or almost at the corner. And then I just use my hand, I'm push, pushing up with my thumb and down with my finger to slice through 
the, the resin, the tape, and the paint all in one go. And you can see that very quickly, you can cut through everything and you're gonna end up with a nice clean edge and this peels straight off. There we go. So that's one done. Now with my tape, the tape is just slightly shy of two inches so it won't cover my four inch tile completely. So I get this little bit in the middle. That is where it will get caught or stuck where there is paint and resin. So you just have to be a little bit more careful when you're going over that area that you're not going too quickly, otherwise you can skip um, and it will bounce off that little section there. But you can see this is really quite quick um, and you will know if your blade needs to be changed because it won't cut through as easily. And the amazing thing about these little craft knives is once it is dull, you can just follow the guide, snap that off, and you've still got plenty of blade left. So it doesn't slow down your process too much. You don't have to fiddle around unless you have to refill the whole cartridge with more blades. Um, so yeah, very quick process to do this. And then all I do to finish up the presentation for these is I attach some self-adhesive four inch cork. I get these from Amazon. Um, I've tried looking on AliExpress and um, all of those sorts of sites, but I haven't been able to find any. And I'm actually surprised that these fit because I thought these were a different kind of cork. But now I think about it, I'm going crazy. The reason they didn't fit was because my tiles were smaller. <laughs> so I built this little, like a little contraption to try and, um, you know, make the cork fit. So because my tiles were slightly smaller than four inches, I built this little contraption here. And what I would do is I would put a blank tile, so it's something that I haven't painted on in here, line it up with the corner with one or two sheets of the cork. And then I would just take my um, rotary knife, so it was a round one, and I would trim off the excess from the blank tile and it wouldn't matter like I wasn't damaging any design because it's a blank tile. And now that I've remembered that, that makes me, that means that I can use these, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, you know, this process is quite quick. It doesn't have to take too long. Um, it's much quicker than sanding. I would much rather spend the time taping up the tiles and removing it this way than having to worry about sanding and having resin dust everywhere, um, having a facility that you can sand in. So, you know, you, you want to do it outside or um, somewhere with dust extraction um, because you do not want to be breathing in the resin dust at all that can very negatively affect your health so just as it is when it's wet when it's um, dry and dusty you don't want that either so this is the finished product okay looks gorgeous under resin I will do a full uh, rundown of all of the coasters that I've done um, and put them into the ends of the videos if I remember to do so. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is what they all look like. All resined, all finished up. Uh, now I will grab a placemat or a clock to show you how I take the tape off of those. The process is the same, um, but because they are wood, you just need to be a little bit more careful, I guess. Not even careful, just um, you might be in for a little bit of a surprise if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, so with the wood ones, um, I try not to get my knife underneath because there's a chance that I could stab into the wood and take out a chunk. Um, but with these, generally, the paint comes right off and you don't have to worry about anything. Um, I am being cautious here so that I can keep this round. Um, so the round is just some clear cellophane, um, but I use them multiple times. So it is looking like I'm going to have to get my knife in here on these, which I don't like doing. Um, but you just take your knife, run it very, very carefully around the edge. You're just trying to break through the paint and the tape to get a nice clean edge. Now, because I'm using these for clocks, I'm not 100% overly fussed at how that final edge is going to be. It's not a presentation edge, but I do always like to try and finish things, you know, to a high standard. 
um, so that they're as saleable as possible. So let me try and pull this tape off. Here we go. Okay, and in this case, the tape is pulling up some of the fi the fibres of the wood. Um, so yeah, just be prepared for that. Don't don't freak out if you know wood fibres come up. But you can see that there's tape here. This doesn't look great to me, so I just go round with my knife and scrape those bits off. And again, just be really careful. Take it slow. Don't rush through everything. And everything should look fantastic. And they have a nice cleaned up edge. So I did do the four placemats that I have done for my commission piece, which is awesome. This piece looks so much better under resin. <laughs> I wasn't sure about it, but I really, really love it. The color combination worked out so well. And this is the piece that you can really see the power of that iridesc Pepeo iridescent blue black uh, under the resin. It looks so different to what it does wet or dry uh, in the tube. So yeah, really cool there. Um, now this one, I probably should have left the tape on and redone because this edge is a little bit um, dodge, but it's done now. I could just tape it up and redo it later, but I'm not too fussed. Again, as it's going to be a clock um, and it's not got functional use where it needs full coverage heat resistance, I'm not too fussed about that. Um, speaking on that, uh, when you're working with resin, you have to have a tolerance set up. So I did notice that with some of these coasters, there are bubbles or the resin layer isn't perfect. Is it worth going back and doing another coat? Some people might say yes. Um, you've got to learn to live with tolerances within your resin. You can't get it 100% perfect every single time. Um, with things like coasters, it's not worth putting a second layer of resin on there because you're, you're just putting drinks on them at the end of the day. and. You know, if it was a if it was an art piece where it's going on a wall and people are going to be looking at it all the time, then yes, I would where you want a flawless finish. But because these are functional items, they're going to get marked and scratched and dented eventually. The bubbles are not going to make a difference. The the two or three bubbles that are in there. So don't stress too much about imperfections in your artwork. Some people absolutely kill themselves to try and get it right. However, the more layers of resin you put on there and the more you try and get that perfect, the more cost you're incurring to yourself, both in time and materials. Resin is not cheap. Um, I just went to order some more stone coat resin, um, found out that it's pretty much out of stock everywhere here in Australia at the moment. Um, and the only place that does have it is Barnes and they're charging $200 more than what I purchased resin for last year. So there's no way I could fathom paying $200 more and then putting an extra layer of resin onto my coasters. That's just not, it's not feasible. It's not a good business practice, especially if you are selling your work. Um, you wanna do things for as little cost to yourself with as much output. So in, in saying that, you know, live with tolerances, learn to accept the, the little flaws in your work. Your customers don't need to know about it. They don't need to know that, you know, you had to put six layers of resin on there. At the end of the day, they don't care. They're looking at the finished product and going, okay, yep, I want it or I don't want it. Um, there is no point trying to flog a dead horse and sell something to a client if they're not interested in buying it at, at all, you know? If they've stopped to have a look at your stall, something piqued their interest. Maybe they saw a color, maybe they saw something. You can try and hustle and try and sell something to them, but at the end of the day, if they just say, oh, I'm just looking, thanks, you know, don't pressure them. Don't say, are you looking for something specific? Um, ask for color combinations, yes, but they're there to have a look. They're not, not there to go, yep, I definitely want that. If they are, they already know what they want. You don't need to assist them. Um, be friendly, do all that sort of stuff, but um, yeah, leave them to their own devices, pretty much. Um, so I'm very happy with how these have turned out. Um, these wood boards from uh, Spotlight were really awesome. So what I will do with the backs of these now is I'll give them a couple of days to cure so that the top doesn't get scratched. Then I'll flip them over and I'll put some um, tissue paper or glassine paper on the uh, surface side or a puppy pad and just something soft. And what I will do is I'll flip them over, I will varnish the backs, I'll do two coats of varnish so it really soaks into the wood, that will seal all those fibres in, and these are going to be good to go. Um, 
with resin to clean it. You can give it a little bit of a spritz with isopropyl alcohol um, and a paper towel to wipe it down. But make sure you only do that after they've had uh, a full week to cure. Otherwise, you may end up scratching the surface. All right, guys, that's it for the resin video. Um, like I said, once they're all done, you can put your, your self-adhesive cork on the back and um, I use my little stamp with some stays on ink. So I use the stays on ink, which is an alcohol based ink um, or a solvent based ink. And I just had a stamp made up with my logo from uh, Penrith stamps. And the stays on ink is better because if they do get water on them, the ink will stay. If it's normal uh, acrylic ink, it will run if it gets wet. I have learned that lesson the hard way. So um, I'm gonna finish up taking all the tape off these coasters. If you've enjoyed this video, if you liked this video, if it was helpful, helpful, leave a thumbs up, like and subscribe. Put your comments in the video below if you want me to do any more tutorials or if there's anything you'd be interested in seeing on my channel. Um, but for now, hopefully you're more confident to do resin. You shouldn't be scared to do resin. Um, you just have to dive right in and give it a go. Um, but yes, follow all the safety directions, follow these instructions, and you should be just fine. All right, guys, I will see you in the next video. Take it easy. Bye.